welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to show you how to configure the GPIO pins on a Raspberry Pi as inputs and to trigger them in Python using physical switches, read switches and light sensors. In this video I'm going to be using this uh, Raspberry Pi 3, but you can do what I'm doing here on any Raspberry Pi, so you could use a Pi 3 or a Pi 2 or something like a Model B Plus or even an original Raspberry Pi or a, a Pi Zero. I'm also going to be using this little breadboard which allows me to connect different components together. And given this is a video about inputs, I'll be using various switches, uh, specifically this uh, momentary push switch which I found lying around in my electronics bits box and which has already got some nice wires soldered onto it. But I'll also be experimenting connecting the Pi's input to this read switch and to this uh, IR reflectance sensor from Adafruit. I'll say a bit more about these two as we get to the relevant point in the video. Also required to make things actually work will be some jumper leads to connect to our Raspberry Pi and a few other wires for making connections on the breadboard. Just for fun, at some point I'll also be including this LED. And then finally, to make everything work okay, I'm going to need to include various resistors. Now if you're thinking, why do I need resistors to use the input on a Raspberry Pi? Well, to explain that, I've got to go through a little bit of electronics theory. The most obvious way to connect a switch to a GPIO input on a Raspberry Pi would be a circuit something like this. So that when we press the switch, we connected 3.3 volts, the logical level one, to the GPIO pin. However, if you wire things like this, when the switch is not pressed, when it's open, the input is what's called floating. It doesn't know whether it's at the logical value of one or zero. So to prevent this, what we can do is to connect the GPIO pin to the ground rail to zero volts so that when it's not pressed, it's at a logical level of zero. Now, as you might have noticed, there will be some problems doing this in exactly this way. For a start, when we press the switch, the GPIO pin is connected to both the zero volts rail, the ground rail, and to 3.3 volts. And more worryingly, we have here created a short between 3.3 volts and the ground rail, which is clearly not a good idea. So, to make this work in practice, we include what's called a pull-down resistor. Here a 10K resistor on the ground rail, so that the pin is held down at the ground level when it's not pressed, but rises to 3.3 volts when the switch is pressed, but we don't draw a lot of current between the ground rail and 3.3 volts. Now, this arrangement is what's called pull down, but you could do it the other way. You could use what they call pull up and put our 10K resistor, our pull up resistor here between 3.3 volts and the pin. And then when we press the switch, it would drop down to the ground level. But here I'm going to use a pull down arrangement. So we have a pull down resistor on our ground line to the switch. Now, in theory, this would work just fine, but let's imagine what would happen if you accidentally turned your GPIO pin from an input to an output while making an error in your code. What that would mean is you might connect, for example, an output which was at, say, zero volts through to 3.3 volts if you press the switch. This would pull a lot of current through the Pi and almost certainly damage the GPIO pin and maybe even the Pi itself. So to prevent this, we're going to include a current limiting resistor, a 1K resistor out from the GPIO pin like this. Now, you might hear some people saying you don't need this pull down resistor, you don't need this current limiting resistor, things will work without them. And they might in some circumstances and you might get away with it. But for good practice and to not damage your Pi, you're best to include these resistors. You might also hear that the Pi has got some internal pull down and pull up resistors, which you can turn on and off. And that is true, you can turn them on and off in software. But they aren't that powerful to be really certain you don't do any damage. And to learn good electronics practice, you should use the sort of configuration you're looking at right here. Right, here we are back in the uh, real world with our Raspberry Pi, which I've got mounted on a little board as I showed you in a fairly recent video. And I've also got our breadboard with some components fitted. And what I've basically done here is to set up the circuit you've just seen on screen, but in obviously the real world. 
So what we have here is a wire from pin one on the pier, that's plus 3.3 volts. That is going down to form a positive rail down here. I'm using one of the negative rails, the ground rails on the pie, pin 20, which is going round from this wire to give us a negative rail down here. I've then chosen to use pin 16 as our GPIO what will be output pin here with the green wire. There are lots of different pins you can use as input or outputs on the Pi. General GPIO pins, you can see them all here. But here I've chosen pin 16, which connects across to this rail on the board. That then connects through our 1K current limiting resistor. That's a brown, black, red resistor. And that links to the row above it, where it is going to link it through to our switch, which will link it through to the positive rail. So here we just got the switch, which basically means when we press that, positive will go through from the positive rail through the current limiting resistor to our GPIO input. We've also got links through there after the current limiting resistor, our pull down resistor, our 10K resistor, brown, black, orange, and that just links through to our negative rail. If you can't tell you that exactly clearly on screen in this format, maybe it's clearer for you in this format as a diagram, but either way, I hope you can see what I've set up. So, we'll now go over to um, Raspbian. I'm going to run up the idle environment to actually do a little bit of coding. I'll show you some code that'll run this. So I'll run the terminal. I'm going to type sudo idle. You don't have to use idle to write your Python code, but if you do, you must use sudo before it to run it as a super user if you want to control the GPIO pins. And there we are, idle has run up, and as usual, I'll just try to adjust the size so it doesn't go off the edges of anybody's screens. So, here I've got some code already written. If I go to recent files, I've got a input test bit of code written there with this look. Hopefully it'll be a lovely piece of code. And I'll just show basically what I've done. So we start off by importing the library to control the GPIO pins, RPI GPIO, with the command import RPI GPIO as GPIO. Above that, I put some commenting in. If I don't comment my code, people moan at me. So basically everything here that starts with a hash and then appears in red isn't part of the code. It's simply some comments there to tell people what's going on. After that, I need to set up how the GPIO pins are going to work. To do that, first of all, I have to tell the Pi what numbering system to use for the pins. Here I'm using board numbering, which is the simplest one. I find it the easiest to use, although not everybody agrees. This simply means the pins are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 across in a logical fashion. According to that numbering, I'm then going to set pin 16 as our input. So GPO set up 16 GPO in. And then going to run a small loop and I'm going to run it in a try finally setup. So basically it's going to try to run this and it's going to then run a while loop. Now, a while loop basically executes as long as the condition you've given it is true. And here I've written while true, which means this loop will run forever, because that true command, or that true statement there, will always be true. So it'll run, first of all, to see if GPI input 16 equals zero. Note you have to have a double equal sign to do a comparison here in Python. If GPO 16 is zero, it'll print open, because of course the switch is open, it's at logical state zero. Else, if it's not open, it's closed, it's at a one, logical value of one, it'll print closed. Now, that loop will go on forever because there's no way out of it, but if we press Control c to actually exit the program, it will still here execute the finally command. That's the whole purpose here of using try and finally. Whatever happens with the program, it'll always execute what you put under the, the finally statement. And so here what it'll do is to clean up the output of our GPO pins, which means if we run a program again, they'll be all set that back to a clean state so everything runs okay. So if we bring the um, Pi back up on screen, I'll run this piece of code. You can run by pressing F5, but here I'll use the menu so you can see what I've done. And as you can see, it prints the word open. Until I press the switch, it presses closed, open, closed, open. And you can play with that for hours. We're communicating with our Pi, our GPIO, by pressing a switch. Dun, 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 dun. And there we are. And if we get really bored, we press Control c and it'll finish the thing off. Right, now let's try something a little bit more potentially useful. I've got another piece of code here. Again, it starts the same way, and we're going to load in the uh, GPIO library, and I'm going to set the board numbering and set pin 16 as an input. 
What we're going to do here, though, is a situation where you might want to press the button to then start something off. So in other words, the Pi will wait, you'll press the button, then something will happen in your code. So to simulate that, first of all, we're going to print the statement, press the button, and then we're going to go into another while loop. But here we've given the while loop a condition based upon the GPIO pin, which is if GPIO pin 16 is zero, that means it's true, the while loop will continue to operate. So if the switch isn't pressed, if the logical level of the switch is zero, it'll execute what's called the pass command. Now the pass command is simply a null operation. It does nothing at all, but it allows it to have a while loop that keeps going around and around and around. So once the switch is pressed, that condition there is no longer true, and because the switch is at level one, it'll then print thanks, and then finally, it'll clean things up and exit the program. So once again, let's see if that works. We will run the module, bring the Pi back up on screen, and I think I'll just pull that over here so we don't miss the excitement. So it pressed print the button, it's waiting for a button press, I will go in, press the button, there we are at Prince Tanks, and the thing comes to an end. Right, we're now going to try to link up our Raspberry Pi to a, one of these, which is a reed switch. Now this is quite a large reed switch, but like all reed switches, it's basically got two contacts inside a hermetically sealed little glass tube, you can maybe see that there. And the way a reed switch operates why it's so useful is because it operates with a magnet. So if I bring a magnet in here, I've got an old speaker magnet here, and hopefully, if I get it right, yeah, you can see the contacts move there slightly, and they close and open in the presence of a magnetic field. And that makes it very easy to count things or other things like that when something happens. These are often used, for example, in um, counting systems where maybe counting a gate opening or closing as it comes close, or maybe you use them in an alarm system, so like in a security system. So let's wire this into our Pi. And uh, here we are. I've got the uh, read switch linked in here, exactly the same way as the previous switch on our second row in the breadboard with its two resistors, linked in here to a uh, GPIO pin 18. I've also linked in an LED with a current limiting resistor, a 470 ohm resistor, yellow, violet, brown. That's linked in to a pin 12. So if we look at the code, this is some slightly more complicated code. It again imports libraries. It again sets up the GPIO numbering and the pins, here setting 18 also to an input, 12 to an output. I then set up a counter, because this is a counting program. I set the counter value to zero. And I set up a state variable for our read switch to tell us that it's currently not um, closed. It's then going to, this program print now counting, press button to stop. And it's then going to perform a while loop um, as long as the button hasn't been pressed as we did previously. And it'll first check if the read has been newly activated. In other words, if the read switch's input is, is a one and the state is currently zero. If that's the case, it will um, turn on the LED set the read state to 1 because it's just been turned on and add 1 to the counter. It's then going to pause for a small period of time, just for 0.1 seconds, because of an issue called debouncing. When you close a switch, it doesn't actually close cleanly. Most switches bounce around a bit. You might cut several counts if you don't have a little bit of a, of a gap. It then checks to see if the read switch has been released, see if it's now on a zero state, but the state is still recorded as 1. If so, it turns off the LED and um, resets the state. And then finally, which is when we've pressed the button, it will print the counter and clean things up. So that's the code we've got. Should just mention because I've used the time variable here, I should have told you that back at the top here, uh, I've also imported a library for time. Anyway, let's now see if this all works. Rather exciting bit of code. We'll run the module and it'll tell us it's um, counting. Press button to stop. So if I now take our magnet and go Yes, as you can see, every time I bring the magnet in, lights the LED, registers a count. So imagine this is, say, a, um, a gate with a magnet in, registering it's been closed, something like that. So we've been counting like that. And when we get really bored, we can go back and press the button, and it'll tell us it counted, in that case, eight things. So there, we're getting a bit more practical using our read switch and the switch and an LED, all linked up to our good old Raspberry Pi. Right, 
As a final experiment, I thought we'd wire in one of these to our Pi, which as you can see is a reflectance sensor from Adafruit. And in fact, I bought two of these, so here's one outside of the package. You'll see why I bought two a little bit later on. And what you've basically got here, if you, you can see, is you've got two devices in one package. What you have here is a photo transistor and an infrared LED. And of course, on the bottom, we've got the wires that go next to those. So what you do with this is you wire it up so that the uh, LED emits infrared, and then you wire up the photo transistor as a switch with appropriate pull down resistors, etc. And then the idea is when the infrared is um, beamed out of here, if you put a piece of say white card or something white over the top, it will reflect it back to the photo transistor and you can register an input. And if it can't see anything to reflect it, it doesn't. So this is a means of reading things optically via an input on your Raspberry Pi. And here we are, everything's all uh, wired up. Lighting's a little bit dark in this shop because I'm having to make it work um, so it doesn't actually wreck the function of this uh, IR sensor. But basically, we've got the reflectance sensor wired in, so the phototransistor is a switch into our pin 16 GPIO input with the usual current limiting and pull down resistors. We've also got five volts through a 470 ohm resistor powering the uh, IR LED on this unit, and we've got another LED here wired into pin 11 with a typical uh, current limiting resistor. As usual, you'll probably see things a lot clearer if we show you on the actual circuit diagram. This is what I wired up, basically what we've got before, except our switch is now a photo transistor, and we've wired up an LED and the LED on the sensor. So, if we now look at some code, this is a very simple bit of code, pretty much of what we've seen already. I've actually imported the GPIO library, I've set up the board numbering, set pin 16 to an input, pin 11 to an output. Why have I used pin 11 as the output this time? I have no idea, I just have. And we've got exactly the same type of loop that I showed you in a finally statement in our very first example. Except here, when the input is one at a high level, it'll turn on the LED, else it'll turn it off. So, let's run this exciting piece of code. Nothing immediately happens, but if I actually move my finger over the sensor, oh, it'll turn the LED on. There's enough reflectance from my skin to bounce the IR light back onto the sensor. I've also got here a piece of cardboard. If I move this piece of cardboard at about the right height over the sensor, turn the LED on, off, on, off. It's turning it on and off. How's it doing that? Well, on the other side of this card, there is a black line. So effectively, this is bouncing off the white, not off the black, off the white, not off the black, etc. If you're thinking you could use two of these sensors to make a line following robot, indeed you could, and in fact I'll be doing that in a future Raspberry Pi robotics video. Once you've learned how to configure GPIO pins as inputs and as outputs, you're all set to use a Raspberry Pi in all kinds of exciting projects. But now that's it for another video, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.